Amateur Hour, it's his first time producing, oh yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Rob Jarosinski and this is Amateur Hour. It has been a good bit of time since I've come on here to talk a little bit about ontology. It was my intention to do this on a weekly basis, which was uh, probably something that I, sh I should have considered uh, that would not be sustainable. Um, but it has been far longer than than weekly. Um, it's been probably closer to annually than it is weekly at this point. Um, the last time I've had a chance to sit down and, and chat with you all, uh, I think was back, oh gosh, in maybe uh, April of this year. <laughs> so, um, and that wasn't even for a formal amateur hour uh, podcast. The goal of amateur hour of course, is to uh, document uh, my trials and tribulations as I try to embark on being a first-time film producer with the film Hauntology. Um, it certainly has led to several other opportunities that I will touch on briefly, but this episode is going to be really more of a catch-up than anything. Um, I will dive in to a little bit of marketing and distribution because that is what is now top of mind for Hauntology as we are uh, getting closer and closer to having the final, final, final finished cut of the film with everything, all the bells and whistles uh, included on it. So um, I guess that's probably the a good place to start is with Hauntology and uh, the wrap. Uh, when we caught up a little bit in April, we were kind of in a space where uh, there was going to be a gap of time between when we wrapped in December, our December segment, which was our paint and black lace segment, we wrapped that in December of 2022, and we weren't scheduled to film again until June. And that was a way for those uh, who maybe are listening for the first time, it was a way to preserve the seasonality that we wanted with each of the segments of the anthology. So we had filmed one in August of 2022, October of 2022, December of 2022, and then the final segment uh, and the through line would be filmed uh, during June uh, of 2023. And what was exciting about doing that was we had really only filmed one week out of a time. And that also was by design. And in fact, many fellow producers who've been in this business far longer than I um, really were apprehensive about the fact that we were going to be shooting in these chunks. Would we be able to keep and maintain our crew throughout to have some consistency? Would we be able to maintain our cast, even though they were uh, different cast members per segment? Um, you know, how would this all work out typically isn't done this way. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a little bit scary to have this huge gap of time, uh, between the, the December segment, paint black lace, and then the old dark Cashel house. And then also go from single week filming, uh, with breaks in between to what ended up being really three weeks, almost back to back, uh, to back. And that was something that I was nervous about having been extremely taxed from being on these weekly shoots, I could not fathom carrying that, uh, the load of filming and the, the energy that that's needed, um, if over the course of more than a week, um, I'm certainly not built for production, uh, as far as being able to, to do that and bring my best self, I guess, uh, every single day. So kudos to all of those who are on the front lines filming, uh, you know, doing 12, 12 to 15 hour days, waking up the next day, doing it all over again, um, you know, getting a little bit of a weekend break uh, to re recover and then back at it um, again on Mondays. Um, some people do six day shoots, some people do seven day shoots. And, you know, I don't know how you all are managing to sustain that. Part of the beauty of the weekly process, too, was that we will, we all left wanting more. Um, we left on good terms. We hadn't, for the most part, gotten on each other's nerves too much where all of us were excited to see each other. So what would that look like as we embarked on the June segment? Um, a couple things that had popped up, I think that I had mentioned since as we uh, shifted from a, you know, what was a castle location, almost a too good to be true um, location on paper uh, to this, this wonderful bed and breakfast, Victorian 1800s bed and breakfast over in Norwalk, Ohio. And we had a feeling that, that Matt and Aaron, the proprietors of Gramps Crossing over in Norwalk, would be fabulous, but we had no idea. So I'll start off our story um, going leading into uh, the June segment, and uh, you know everything between December and June was a lot of work, uh, 
mainly from Parker and our editor, Jim Bailey, who were doing um, assembly cuts of that because we wanted to see, you know, how this how this was all piecing together. And one big decision that we made along the way was changing up the segment order. And one of the benefits that we decided that came with shooting the way that we did is we put the through line last because the through line of the story that connects all of the individual segments of the anthology together. Um, if there was something that changed, the through line could serve almost as expo exposition or connect things later. But once we had the through line done, it's far harder to go, then go back and change an aspect of, uh, of the individual segment. So we did end up, end up having some story tweaks that, that needed to be either explained through, uh, through the through line. So Parker also had a ton of work to do on the writing side in order to get things updated. The other big, I wouldn't say it's a complication, but just the reality of filmmaking is we decided against having a picture car, uh, uh, which is the car that you use during filming and a process trailer, which carries the car and does, uh, you know, carries the car on the streets. The actors are safely behind the wheel. Crew is on a trailer and they're filming uh, more and more. Uh, films and TV shows these days are using what's, you know, called, I don't know if there's another term for it, but it's called the poor man's process trailer. And that is doing it with on a stage setting. And that typically you see in sitcoms, like the really bad ones are green screen. They've gotten actually quite good at it. them now having things like the volume or led walls behind uh, cast members. But as we started looking at our budget, which always plays into role, we realized that we needed to try to write our way around the situation. So we ended up um, not going with that and having a lot of the dialogue elements that would take place during the car setting to happen as the car was pulling in or in car while it was stationary. We still have beautiful uh, shots, uh, establishing shots of the car, cars driving and people pulling up to, to the, you, no one will know the difference. Um, but from a safety and soundness concern and budgetary concern, uh, we did want to change those aspects around. So that's really what December through June was, was all preparation. Parker doing a lot of work on the writing side, Jim doing a lot of work on the editing side. Um, and then we also changed a little bit of the order of the segments too. Originally we had, we were kind of shooting sequentially in the order that uh, that the anthologies would present themselves. But what we kind of found through uh, reviewing the edits was that each of them, and it's really tough. There is no favorite amongst them. They're all very unique and they all have a distinct energy. And what we wanted for the audience to start off a little bit on a higher energy, uh, the segment that we had originally planned is a little bit more contemplative um, and reflective. Uh, there's a lot that happens in it, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a slow burn. And we didn't want to start with the slow burn. We wanted to get the audience having some energy and some excitement. Um, early on. So we reordered uh, the seg segments a little bit again, leading to some rewrites for Parker, unfortunately. Um, but everything connected really well. Um, and then kind of going into our June segment, um, which was going to be our, it's called the old uh, dark Cashel house. It was also going to be the opportunity for Parker and all of us to work with, you know, an extreme horror icon legend. Um, I still haven't even, we haven't dropped the name of who the person is yet. Um, that will come out a little bit closer to release, uh, but it's it's incredible. This person has been retired for for about forty years, and um, this is the first project that they're doing coming out of retirement, and it really spoke to them. Um, and it was really great to have them aboard. And boy, they shook off that that forty years of not doing it very quickly, and did an amazing job in the role. It was, it was, um, it was almost as if it was written just for them. Um, we also had the lovely uh, Lindsay McDowell who was playing one of the lead characters as well. And then Annie Fitzpatrick as well. So it was a really small, uh, small group of, of, of actors um, at this beautiful Victorian uh, in Norwalk, Ohio. So just, you know, quick summary of how that, uh, how that went is that was two weeks in June. Um, and, what we also learned from prior segments was in order for this shooting to be sustainable, we needed to increase our crew. Um, we were getting by barely um, week to week uh, in, in this weekly fashion with minimal crew. And one of the things that we needed to stop doing that we found out in December is relying on producers help uh, to 
carry the load. And it's not that we're not capable as producers, but if you're relying on a producer to do detailed work or work that is really meant for people, for craftspeople, um, you really need, it's not the best way to go. If a producer can help and is available to help and to do things, that's great. But, um, you know, you can't always count on them to be there uh, to pick up the slack or to do the things that we didn't account for. Cause there's always random things that pop up on set. So we wanted to increase the cast or sorry, the crew, the crew numbers slightly to augment. So we brought in a few new folks, otherwise kind of going against the grain of the sage advice that I got from pretty much every single producer is we were able to keep 90% of our crew uh, throughout the, a year of filming. And I think a lot of it had to do with they really enjoyed one another's company. I certainly enjoyed spending time with them. Um, they had probably other projects that they could have bounced to, but they kept coming back because of the folks. And for the other 10%, um, it was really just, yeah, timing issues or project conflicts. And we would never want to hold anybody back from a better financial opportunity because films, you know, don't always come uh, come knocking. So if someone had a better opportunity, we you know, wanted to release them from their obligation um, to be able to go seek that out and, and further themselves. But otherwise, like, like I said, 90% of the crew was the same. So we did augment, we added um, a couple more folks on camera to help with, with the camera side and then help our assistant directing team as well. We brought in someone who kind of played a little bit of a swing um, as a second, second AD, as well as a production coordinator. Um, and then my role then on set was really more on as the you know production manager, um, so to speak, um, loosely playing those types of things. Um, but I was just really focusing on uh, focusing on my day job uh, more than anything. And then the first day in in June on set was like, oh my gosh, we didn't bring bug spray, we didn't bring this kind of stuff. So I was running around a little bit more than I would have liked. But after that, things kind of calmed down, and I got to to sit and let the people who make movies make movies and um, I did get to pick up uh, the, the, the the horror icon uh, in Cleveland. We had a lovely drive for about an hour. We even stopped off and looked at, um, I think it's whatever lake that is, Lake Erie. I Oh gosh, very embarrassing that I don't know what lake that is. Let's hope it's Lake Erie. Um, I think it is. And, you know, we just hung out a little bit um, and yeah, got to know each other. And that's where the, you know, the trust kind of starts getting built is to, I, I, I wonder what it is from a cast member's perspective. You're walking in, walking on set and you don't really know what you're walking into. Is this going to be like garbage? Are they going to know what they're doing? Or, you know, are these people kind? Like, are they not like, and just kind of, I, I, I met, you know, I, I wonder what that experience is like, but um, she was awesome. Uh, Lindsay was awesome too. Um, so yeah, we're up in Norwalk, uh, Norwalk, Ohio. The town was extremely welcome, welcoming. Um, the, the mayor knew we were going to be there and the police chief and, this was one where we, we ended up shutting down the street for a little bit. One of the things that I've come to find is, boy, um, noise and sound matter significantly. Um, even when you think things are quiet, they're not. They're never quiet enough. The only sound you want to be capturing is the actor's um, sound and the ambiance uh, without any additional thing. So cars driving by loudly um, or any car driving by. This was the, the Graham's Crossing. Well, it's, it's beautiful and, and, and serene and. Uh, and perfect. Um, it, it is on a little bit of a busier throughway. Um, so we did end up having to, because you're always just running up against time. And so every time you need to wait for cars to pass is less time that you're filming and you just have less options then as a filmmaker, um, you're not able to get the coverage that you need or the shot angles that you wanted to, or, you know, have the liberty to go be creative and try something that you were wanting to try, but you, you know, you didn't think you'd have enough time to, but Filming in the house was extraordinary. One of the things that I recall mostly about that uh, that first week was just how lovely Aaron and Matt, the proprietors, were again. Um, I'm actually wearing one of the shirts that they made. So they made uh, the Boo Crew shirts. For those who are watching on YouTube, you can see, uh, see the shirt. Uh, they brought in friends and family to help us load in on the first day. Um, unexpected. And they were all wearing Hauntology Boo Crew shirts. Um, which was, which was fantastic. And yeah, they became part of the filming family. Um, it looked, you're going to love it on film. The place is extraordinary. Um, it also, by having it be so prepared, it really lessens the burden on production design. So 
folks like Maddie and Stefanica, who are a production designer and, and set decorator, respectively, uh, you know, still had a ton to do, but less to do with in the house. Um, and it was more focused on fine details than it is like, you know, let's put some fake wood paneling to make this look Victorian or let's paint the walls because they're all barren white and, you know, it looks terrible on film. So having a place uh, really be the focal point as well uh, was was awesome. Um, I don't recall any, I remember it being very smooth and that could be my rose colored glasses that I tend to have with, with everything as time passes, but that first week seemed smooth. Um, and the second week, uh, quickly came about and that was when we would start the through line. So while the, 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 the through line does not actually intersect with any of the segments, we do visit locations and there's a big finale at, at the, at the, um, bed and breakfast location that we were at. So that is when we brought on our two, you know, you know, we have so many leads within each segment. Uh, these are our through line leads. So these are the the folks that you're going to sit with probably for the majority of the film playing the Jasmine, uh, Jasmine and Venus characters. And that's um, Jasmine played by Samantha Russell, the great Samantha Russell, and then uh, Venus played by the great uh, Jaden triplet. Um, so we were really lucky to have them. And we actually had the entire triplet family out. So, um, Jaden's younger sister, Jordan, um, dad, Joshua, and then mom, uh, Nori as well, were, were all out and they kind of made it a big, um, homecoming because they are, um, Josh, uh, Joshua's, uh, originally from the Ohio area. So, um, it kind of worked out perfectly that we got to have them all come out and, um, be part of the experience. And one of the things that you learn working with, uh, no, first of all, uh, Jaden is incredible. Um, more capable and um well beyond her years which is which is super helpful so she was able to deliver performances in short periods of time and why that's important is because as a minor you're really limited um to how many hours you can work and that's something that parker had built into the schedule um but time again being your best friend and worst enemy um you know you want to make sure that you're maximizing the time with the when, when a child is on set um, there's also rest and relaxation periods that are built in. So, you know, when you factor everything in, you you might be en ending up getting like maybe six hours out of a 12 hour day. So we were, Parker was extremely diligent in organizing the schedule with our first AD Victoria uh, to make sure that everything went smoothly so that, you know, we were able to release uh, Jaden uh, when she needed to be released and, uh, you know, just make sure we're following the rules and doing everything above board. Um, but yeah, I, I'm trying to remember, uh, something that went wrong just so I could share that experience with you. But, uh, that second week was pretty smooth as well too. And it also welcomed the first time that my family had been able to be on set. So I had come back after filming week one. Um, I, I flew back on like a Saturday or a Sunday and then turned around and drove back out with my family for a vacation, uh, for a one week vacation up in the o Ohio area in that Norwalk area. We were going to go to Cedar Point and take some of the cast and crew who were available and take them to Cedar Point. Um, and um, that that part was special, just having the girls and my nephews see, you know, what dad's been up to for the last year or so. Um, they really got bitten by the, the movie magic as well, too. And uh, my in-laws, uh, Ron and Kay, were also there and got to spend time with cast and crew and hang out with people and people that knew each other just by name or by text or email, like we all got to see each other. So it was, it was a blast and they got to be there with, uh, for one of the big climactic scenes, um, as well too, and see how it goes. Um, so yeah, that, that was fabulous. And we got to wrap a pretty bow on the second out of third week by going to Cedar point with um, Jaden's family. Um, we had a, we had Ramon, we had Samantha Russell, um, try to think of who else, who else came? Uh, Cheyenne, our SFX makeup artist, along with Jason, came as well, too. Uh, we also had uh, a few returning folks who I can't say because it would give away a bit of a, a bit of a plot point. Um, but yes, we had uh, former cast members also also rejoin us in, in some in some fashion as well, too, for Cedar Point. So that was a wonderful time. We made the most out of that trip. And I just have a ton of memories. I'm going to carry those memories with me for for a long time going to Cedar Point. Um, after week two, I I just didn't have any more time that I was able to give. So thankfully, we had producers step in to be able to kind of 
be the boots on the ground. And that's Ryan uh, Satry and, and Dwayne Gerald, who were kind enough to provide that support with Ryan doing a lot of the production coordinating role that I was doing, making sure sides are printed, just solving problems as they, as they come up. So really appreciated the handoff there. And then um, we even had Preston who was in town on business, be able to stop by on set and see week three. And week three was a lot of the coverage uh, for the through line that needed to be able to connect us. So as we arrived to different locations, we cut to that anthology back in time. Um, it's, it allows the the two main characters, Jasmine and Venus, that those characters to arrive on, on that lo- at the locations that we filmed at over the course of a year and then cut to. So it was a lot of moving parts and a, a lot of pieces. Um, again, minimal stress or things like that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I'd have to check in with Ryan or Dwayne to see, you know, there were a couple, you know, there's always like small things that come up. Um, but by and large, it was great. And um, one of the sad things for me was I wasn't able to make it to uh, to wrap um, the official wrap. I've been for every I haven't missed a single day of filming. Uh, I missed the very final one, um, but I sent in a video and I actually coordinated a video with all uh, as many former cast members and crew members who wanted to submit. We did like a little bit of a uh, of a video recap and played that at the official wrap party, which which took place at Parker's. Parker's house. Parker's house also is Linda's house and Kent's house. Parker's parents um, have to give them a shout out as well, too, for probably embarking on something that they now probably regret doing uh, to a large degree because of how much was how much more was involved than probably all of us uh, guessed. But um, they've been extremely gracious, both on providing us property, but also financial support, tremendous financial support as well, too. So uh, we wrapped in June and it was convenient time wrapping because it was right before the strike and um, the strike ended up kind of kicking off in mid July, if I recall correctly. So we were long clear of the strike. It's not that we had planned it that way, but um, it did work out that we avoided the strikes that would have created some additional complications to get our cast members out there. Um, so what's been going on since June and, and rap is obviously there was a ton of editing that needed to take place. And um However, because we edited along the way, it was really just fine edits for those first three segments. And then it was editing those two individual pieces and then connecting the through line together to all of them. So saved a lot of time, I think, by doing it this way. Um, Otherwise, we would have waited for kind of an assembly cut first. We did receive an assembly cut and, um, you know, it was pretty close to pretty close to final uh, producers had just a few notes that Parker incorporated. And I think we had like picture lock and c- had it colored. I know we had it picture locked and colored by September 4th because that was the Sundance application submission date. Um, so all that was missing, not all, but it's the things that were missing were VFX shots, song composing or sorry, comp- uh, score, uh, sound design and then VFX. And then Parker had commissioned a couple songs by one of their favorite artists, Cameron, uh, to, to, to write some, just some bespoke songs for, for Hauntology, which is really cool. So that was in September. And then we also submitted to South by Southwest because we're not, and really we've just been waiting for those elements to come together. Uh, the VFX just finished up. And so we sent the VFX uh, shots uh, back from our VFX artist to our editor to incorporate those shots uh, back into the full edit and g- get them recolored back in. And then, yeah, the sound design team, um, Jeff Schmidt, and then Jonathan uh, Snipes, who's doing our score, are hard at work uh, just creating art uh, on, on top of art. Um, and I'm really excited about the sound because I think it's going to add a ton to the spookiness and it's going to just add a ton to the energy of the project. If you ever want to test that theory, pull out one of your favorite horror films and watch it on mute and see how much sound design and sound mixing and uh, score contribute to the vibe, the overall vibe of the film and the, the scariness of a film. So um, if we were enjoying the film beforehand, like we were, it's only going to get amplified. So those things should wrap by the end of December is what we're targeting. And because we are targeting that, 
uh, we are also planning, uh, just released an investor screening. So all of our producers, um, I've invited them to, to my house, uh, to, to do a little bit of an investor or to do a private screening, um, in our, in our house. I just, I don't want to watch it again, uh, until it's done. Cause I've seen it, I've seen it built along the way. And I like this last bit is going to have such, it's, it's going to change it so dramatically with having the music and the sound and, um, and the score and everything like that. So the next time I want to see it is with a group of folks who I worked on with it and in its complete form. And so um, I'm really just ultimately trusting Parker, Parker's tastes and things like that on the sound and, and music uh, to get the rest of the way. Uh, because yeah, I just, I want to be surprised. I, I really want to see it all together with the VFX shots in there that I haven't, I've seen the r rough VFX um, changes, but I haven't seen them colored, haven't seen them in context. So all of that is very, very exciting. Um, and that's where, that's where we're at. Um, a lot of folks are probably wondering when is this project? Uh, when am I going to be able to see this project? So you all are seeing it in January. When do I get to put my eyes on it? Well, we're now deep into the start of uh, the festival season. Um, it starts off with Sundance, generally kind of kicks off the annual festival circuit. And so we're trying our best to hit one of those majors. Um, there's less than a 1% chance of getting into something like a Sundance, but there's still a chance. And if you get in, it makes getting distribution and getting um, getting a return that much more likely. So yeah, we're targeting all of the majors up into a certain point. Our goal is to release the film because we think it would reach its full potential around the Halloween season. It is a horror movie after all. So we are planning um, to have a theatrical release uh, or theatrical premieres in three cities um, around the, around September, 2024. And those cities are going to be Los Angeles, Chicago, and Columbus. Why those three cities, uh, the majority of our cast is Los Angeles based. Um, and that's obviously also where the industry lives. So um, we'd like to put that on for friends and family of cast, um, as well as invite industry folks to that, uh, that premiere, uh, theatrical premiere. We'll then, move uh, the theatrical premiere to Chicago, where most of our producers kind of are in that general vicinity. We have a lot of friends and family as well, too. So that'll be a fun place uh, to do a theatrical premiere as well. And then last but not least, Columbus, we will end likely on a Thursday doing a Columbus premiere Thursday night. And then if we are lucky enough to be able to do so, whether we need to four wall, which means pay on our own, or if we're lucky to get some sort of limited theatrical distribution, we're going to try to focus on key cities throughout the United States in independent theaters and do a limited weekend release in late September, and then hopefully have the film release in late September, early October, following the week after the theatrical limited engagement, um, go onto a streaming service of some sort. Um, or premium VOD for a short period of time. And then probably some sort of ad generated one that tends to be a little bit more favorable to filmmakers. So things like freebie or Tubi, um, those tend to pay uh, filmmakers quite a bit more than, you know, uh, the Netflixes of the world or the Hulus of the world. Um, that said, you know, we want to make sure more so than financially, we want to make sure this, this finds as big of an audience as we can. So um, a lot of that will be determined by, Oh, excuse me. Oh, hardly on which distributor we end up going with. And, um, you know, we do have a couple folks uh, lined up. Uh, there's one in particular that we've been in conversations with and um, they're excited to have it. Um, they're also very upfront and saying like, Hey, if you can, if you get into one of these big festivals and it's not us who makes you the best offer, go with the person who makes you the best offer, but we are here for you. Um, you know, in waiting, uh, if, if it comes to that. And so we're planning our festival schedule as such where Fantasia will probably be our last opportunity to have a major, uh, film festival. And if we don't get into Fantasia for some reason, then we will probably quickly pivot to some of the more genre specific ones. Um, because we do want the festival experience. Um, and, and we, you know, even if that doesn't mean being part of the award categories or the categories that win uh, win their respective festivals, 
um, we, we will be bringing it to several festivals just kind of as a showcase piece um, if our distributor allows. So um, that is the plan. Um, you're For those watching on YouTube, you're probably peeking over my shoulder, um, not on the Avengers Infinity Gauntlet series, but more so on the film posters. Um, something I'd love to cover at some point in the future is Hauntology has also blessed me with the fact that I've been given the opportunity, afforded the opportunity to work on several other projects uh, since Hauntology. And that is really what I've come away with. One of the key points of, of being in this business is it is really a networking opportunity. If you do good work, people seek you out. Um, I'm really lucky enough to have completed um, a couple other projects, actually that full top row Hauntology uh, from my left, I guess. Uh, I don't know what vantage point you're looking at, but from my left to right, it's ontology. I put them in order of completion um, or in progress. So I have ontology there. Um, we had a very successful show that continues today with uh, Naomi Grossman's one woman comedy show, American Horror Story. Um, that's going to New Mexico to round out the year um, in late December. And then it's going to New York City in uh, mid to late January and, and having some limited shows there. And then we hope to take it to Chicago as well too. That's been extremely successful. In fact, it just was nominated for uh, best uh, solo production um, to, thanks to Broadway world. So it's, if it's not too late, go out there and uh, go out there and vote for it. Um, also one of our investors was a talented writer and runs a shortwave media number of great horror publications. Um, one of the short stories that um, I was lucky enough to help uh, produce and executive produce is the fort uh, along with Alan, the the writer. Um, we even snagged, our first AD, Victoria McDevitt from Hauntology, and uh, gave her the opportunity to to direct that short. We have a lot of ambition for that short. Uh, it's far beyond um, that limited runtime. Like we have ideas for it to turn into a series or a feature or whatever we're able to, you know, ultimately do. So really psyched about that. We are January is going to be a busy month because we have, as I mentioned, Naomi's New York show, which I'll be flying out to. I'll then come back. For the or sorry, I'll have the investor screening of Hauntology on January 20th, followed by Naomi's uh, opening night in New York City um, on January 23rd. Then we have the Fort uh, screening in LA on January 28th. Um, and then to complete the section there on top, uh, Loaded for Bear, as I sit here and talk on a podcast, um, I was inspired um 10 plus years ago, listening to the film vault, um, Anderson Cowan and Brian Bishop's the film vault, listening to Anderson inspired me uh, to start my own podcast, which led to all of these things in, in a lot of ways and, um, got to be part of Anderson's project called loaded for bear. You can go check it out at loaded for bear doc.com. It started off as a feature film, to be honest, concept and later pivoted to a documentary following a group of intellectually disabled actors as they embark on trying to make their dreams come true and being in a, in a real motion picture. And we were able to give that experience to them in a short film form. Um, and we recorded that and filmed that back in October of 2023. And probably we'll start seeing clips and things of that come out here slowly in the new year as well too. But I think it's a, it's a highly ambitious project and one that is extremely rewarding. And then the ones on the, the bottom row, bottom, again, my left is Goody Goody. We hope to go into production with that with Samantha Robinson and director Raymond Creamer. Um, hope to hope to start that in late January. And then Slay is a passion project of, of mine um, that I've been developing along with uh, Catherine Clark and Zoe Luna and our unnamed, uh, yet to be named uh, director. Uh, we did some location scouting in early November, earlier this month and found a really amazing place to, to film what, what we hope to be a really fun teen slasher uh, with just a little bit of um, humor in it, dark humor in it, because that is what I really enjoy as well, too. And we have a couple of surprises for Slay. So I uh, appreciate you all being on this journey with me and wouldn't have been able to do it with the folks who helped kickstart Hauntology um, as well, too. And I've been uh, neglected to do a good job uh, keeping up with those folks. So if you bear with me, I'd like to go through, uh, at least catch up a little bit on the list and, and check in maybe on some of the other projects as I get into some more details on aspects of filmmaking. But I um, want to thank Jack, who contributed, Dave Wilson, uh, Dominique Gowden, MC Alcock, uh, Johanna Pope, Angeline Iozo, Carrie Schramm, Jason Brusa, 
Andy, uh, Tomas Pachowski, Brian Fowler, Matt, Blake Ryan Stoltz, Brian Newby, Jason Bradbury, Charlotte Susan, Megafauna, Diane McCullough, Matthew Creamer, Abby Lucas, Jaber Debaggia, Dessa Gipolo, Anne Flugi, Kelsey Collier, Jeffrey Clayton, Gavin McDowell, Tanea Smalls, Casey Robichaux, Danuta Volitsky, Laura Trengove, Andrew Budis, Mindy Wetzel, Davy Van Obergen, Christine Stefanski, Bonnie Grutner, Shane Hensinger, Nariman Tahir, Vincent Fung, Joy Vihill, Catherine, Marissa Paterl, Alan Lestufka, Tracy Schick, Annie, Sheila Stokel, Michelle Priest, Antonio, Tanea, or excuse me, Tanya Birch. Actually, we, we, we get that confused at work too. Akash Patel, David Weigel, Ella Pavorsky, Shannon Everyday, and Amanda Wright. I'll stop there because there is quite a bit more folks uh, to go, but um, I didn't want to uh, do them all at one time. So we'll save the, the maybe the last batch or second to last batch. Oh my goodness. We were really like, we had a ton of, it'll have to be at least two more uh, sections of, of Kickstarter readouts because we did have uh, quite a few. Uh, so that gets us to uh, number 100 and we have 135 left. So I'll split it up at, into at least uh, two more sections. So you can at least expect two more podcasts uh, or, or video casts of me coming up here. Happy to start talking a little bit more about other projects. I'll try to think of a, of a theme to go through because um, I think last time we did was location scouting. So, uh, but just wanted to at least catch up with you all before we uh, dive in deep. Um, yeah. And really excited about what's to come and thankful uh, is probably the word I should use. And that's perfect um, as we look forward to Thanksgiving. Hope you all have a wonderful uh, Turkey week. Um, I'll be flying out to Sarasota with the family, uh, taking a little bit of time off um, and enjoying enjoying um, family time um, before getting back uh, to making movies.